All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Today we'll talk about uh, the relationship with uh, PDAs and uh, everything we've done so far. We'll prove that every CFG, every CFG has a PDA. Before we talk about that, let's talk about a little bit about the relationships between the objects we've done so far. Uh, we proved like six, five kinds of regular devices. We proved DFA, <coughs> uh, NFA, yeah. DFA, NFA, uh, regular expression. We proved regular grammar. We technically proved GNFA. And maybe some more. These are all regular languages. And then we proved that every uh, regular grain, uh, every regular language was context free. Um, what we'll do half of today, and we'll do the second half on Tuesday, is we'll prove, in fact, that the languages decided by pushdown automata are exactly those which are produced by uh, context free grammars. Now, the way we'll prove two sets to be equal is, of course, with a double set containment and a simulation proof each way. Today, we're going to prove that every language that has a context-free grammar also has a PDA to decide the language. The reverse implication is going to take some time. It's going to, it's going to be a little bit harder. This is, in some sense, the easier way. The reason this is the easier way is because uh, a PDA is more like an algorithm than you think. A PDA is something that you know how to write code for. I mean, we talked, I mean, from an example, we said, let's think about how we write that as code. So basically, you're going to write a PDA for every possible CFG, um, for any CFG. And that's going to be easier. To program a PDA to do the job of a CFG is kind of easy. To quote unquote program a CFG to do the job of a PDA is not easy. How do you prove, how do you? You know how to write code, and in some sense, that's why you know how to program automatons. How do you know how to write a CFG? That's kind of difficult. A CFG has to simulate the PDA. That proof is a little involved, and we'll do that one the most formally, perhaps the most formal proof in the entire class. Um, this Today's direction is just going to be uh, this one, that we can convert a generic CFG into a PDA. Before we do that, let's uh, t talk about uh, another way we can prove that every uh, regular language is context-free, we can prove that every uh, language that is decidable by an NFA uh, has a PDA for it. Strictly so, in fact. So, in fact, the PDA, we can prove it, before getting into the, the gritty details about context-free grammars and push-down automaton, we can prove that every regular language is decidable by a push-down automaton. How does this proof work? Give me a process to convert an NFA into a PDA. Yeah. Can you just ignore the stack? Yeah, we're going to ignore the stack. So for every transition of the form, let's say we're at QI to QJ in the NFA, we see, I don't know, an A. We're going to, in the PDA, we're going to be for QI, QJ. And we're going to write, read an A as well, but then pop nothing, push nothing. So pop nothing, push nothing, ignores the stack and advances the input. Um, how would you write this notationally? You would be like uh, delta of QI, uh, comma A is equal to the set containing QJ, right? Here you would say uh, delta of uh, QI, comma A, comma epsilon uh, is equal to the set containing the tuple uh, QJ, comma epsilon. So you can convert every NFA into a PDA, and then that's easy. This is, Sipster, the book doesn't actually talk about regular grammars at all. What it does is it waits until it defines PDAs, and then it says, well, every NFA is a PDA, and then using the proof of equivalence of CFGs and PDAs, that's the way you have to determine that every regular language is context-free. Um, kind of involved. The regular grammar route, and in fact, the proof we did was regular expressions. We converted regular expressions into CFGs. So just to, we did that proof. We did that proof, and then we also did this proof, right? So three ways, probably much more, many ways you can do uh, to prove that every regular language is context-free. Um, one is certainly harder than the other, right? 
This one, this one, uh, this the fact that every regular language is context free will require the fact that the CFP is equal to PDAs, which is not an easy theorem to prove. Um, so we see immediately that every uh, regular language at least is decidable by a PDA. Any questions on this? Okay. Uh, before we get into the proof of conversion of a context free grammar, a production device into a decision device, we will uh, generalize the definition of a uh, push down automaton. We'll modify uh, the definition as follows. So instead of reading A, popping B, and pushing C, we're going to allow it to read an input, pop a single symbol, and then push a long word. And we will not allow it to pop a very long string, because what happens if you only pop intermediary? We don't really know how, how to handle that case. But we can modify the transition function in such a way that it pushes the entire string to the input. Uh, how would we do this? How would we modify a PDA? Like, this is a generalization of the definition of a PDA, but I claim is no stronger than the PDA itself. Why? Because you could just, like, if you... Take the two can like if the two conditionals on the left are true, then you just have a long string of pushes that are like epsilon transitions in the conditional side. This is equivalent to this. What you do is you can convert whatever PDA with this kind of rule into a PDA with, oh, my mic's not on. Testing. Uh, to a PDA uh, with the normal definitions just by adding a bunch of redundant states. And then you push the last letter and then the second to last letter and so on into uh, this way. And we do it this way so when you push the string, we say the top of the stack is W1, right? If you push WN, WN minus 1, and so on, the stack will look like this. And we want, just conventionally, when we say push w1 to wn, that w1 is the top of the stack. So this is a generalization of the definition of a PDA. Uh, and when you write a PDA, you can, you're, you can be allowed to do this. It doesn't change anything. Right. Um, why did we need this? This actually ends up making the proof that every CFG has a PDA extremely useful. So we say, uh, let uh, L be in L, C, of G, uh, then there exists a C of G, a context-free grammar, G, to produce L. We give a PDA P to decide L as follows. So when we, when we perform in, in automata theory in general, there's many simulation proofs. You have one kind of computer pretending to be the other kind of computer. But computation is itself a process. It is like, uh, it's not a function. It's a sequence of operations that occur. And the computation is the composition of all those operations. So you want to, uh, if you want one device to simulate another, an easy way to do this is to make sure that the all the intermediary steps are all correctly simulated. And if, if the intermediary steps are correctly simulated, by a quick wave of the wand of induction, you end up getting a correct proof of the simulation. So what we're going to do is consider the intermediary steps of the CFG and try to encode those as intermediary steps of the PDA. So what is an intermediary step of a CFG? Recall that we have a grammar, something like this. When we have a grammar like this, what we do is we have uh, a sequence of working strings.
something like this. We write down a sequence of working strings, and we consider a string to be produced after there's no more non-terminals in the string. So what we're going to do is encode each intermediary working string into a configuration of the PDA, and the PDA will go from uh, configuration, a uh, working string to working string, and that's how the PDA is going to simulate the CFG. I have this cool picture here. We're going to have a PDA this way. It's going to have access to a stack and its input. Something like this. And let's suppose that it had a stack like this. What it's going to do is encode an intermediary uh, working string. Suppose we, we had a working string like A, 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 S, B, 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 right? So this bottom part is some intermediary step of, of, of the productions of a context-free grammar. What we're going to do is the PDA is going to be able to read and write to, not, it's not going to be able to read its write its input, it's going to read its input, and it's going to advance in the input if it matches a string that it's seen in that it, of the simulation of the grammar that is this part of the working string that comes before the first non-terminal. So it's going to encode that part of the working string into uh, the, a prefix of its input. Then it's going to encode the second part of the working string of the grammar on the stack. Right? So it's going to keep or sort of forget. Context free grammar is additive. Once it pushes letters there, it can't ever remove them. So if during the working string you see AAASBBB, you know that whatever string is produced has to begin with AAA. You can't ever insert anything in front of that. You can't ever insert anything after these Bs. Right? So you know the first, whatever string produced has to begin with AAA and end with BBB. So it's going to keep track of that by matching that to its input and advancing forward. And then it's going to keep the rest of the working string on the stack. Now here's the way the computation basically is performed. It's going to pop a non-terminal off the top of the stack and then push a production. Then it's going to pop terminals off the stack. Every time it seems a terminal on the top of the stack, it's going to pop that off. Every time it sees a non-terminal on the top of the stack, it's going to pop it off and then push a production of that non-terminal. That's the way it's going to match the, um, uh, it's going to match to the working string of the context-free grammar. Right. So formally, I would write it like this. When we start, we're going to pop, read nothing off the input, pop nothing, and then we're going to push s dollar sign. So the stack is going to begin not just with dollar sign, but s dollar sign. And s is now a symbol of the stack alphabet, but it's also a non-terminal of the grammar. We're going to have a single state with a very large self loop here. And we're going to accept only when the stack is empty and the input is empty. Now, we're going to have a large self loop here, and what we're going to do is, if there's an A in the input and there's an A on the top of the stack, we're going to pop those and match them for any A that's in sigma. And if there's a non-terminal on the top of the stack, we're going to pop that off. Excuse me, not in the input. We're going to pop a non-terminal off the stack and push a production for every production. of the form uh, A, W. So A is some non-terminal. W is some string of terminals and non-terminals. Every time we see an A on the top of the stack, we're going to pop it off the top of the stack and push the production of the non-terminal. Right? We're going to go very detailed into this with an example and watch the execution. Rather than do a proof of double induction on this one, we'll just do the example very thoroughly, and you'll observe exactly, exactly how the PDA uh, is simulating the grammar. But before we get into that, any questions on this exact PDA? Yeah. So when you say for every production of the form A goes to W, that would be 
a unique item on the self loop, right? If there was a grammar, if, if you had s goes to a, s, b, or epsilon, what you would do is you would have, on the self loop, you would have epsilon, s goes to a, s, b. And then epsilon, s goes to epsilon. That makes sense? Did that answer your question? The, you're going to pop this non-terminal and add terminal, non-terminal, terminal to, this, to the stack. Right? More questions on that one? Let's do an example. So let's do the grammar uh, a to the n, b to the m. Let me make sure I got my letters right. Yeah, we'll do a to the m, b to the n, uh, m is greater than or equal to n, right? This essentially is uh, where m and n are both natural numbers. What this basically is is like uh, it's like a star a to the n, b to the n, because m m is equal to n plus i for i greater than or equal to zero. It's some there's some surplus in m. Um, how would we make a context-free grammar for this? What we would do is we would break this up into two parts. We would do part of it using a to the n, b to the n, and then separately concatenate that to a star. So what I have here is something like s goes to a t, and then a will do the a star part. So a goes to capital A little a, or we'll do properly little, little a capital A or epsilon. And then t goes to a, t, b, or epsilon, right? Is that a correct grammar? Yeah? Questions? Comments? Good. Let's give the PDA. Uh, pop nothing. Uh, read nothing. Pop nothing. Push s dollar sign. Uh, then pop. Read nothing. Uh, pop the dollar sign. Accept. Push nothing. Accept. Now what we're going to do is, um, if we see, uh, for all a and sigma, there's only a and b. So if we see an a in the input and an a in the top of the stack, we'll match it and pop. Right? Now we have a lot of productions. If we see uh, s, excuse me, if we read no input but there's an s on the top of the stack, we'll pop it and push at. If we see an A on the top of the stack, if we see nothing in the input, A on the top of the stack, we'll pop A, push little a, big A. If we see nothing, we pop an A, and we push uh, the empty string. If we, see a, if we see nothing in the input, see a T on the top of the stack, uh, we pop the T and push A, T, B. If we see nothing, we see a T on the top of the stack, we'll push epsilon. Now that we see the example, there's something else that's been made really obviously clear here, is that the wavelengths of the two non-determinisms kind of align up. Uh, the PDA is non-deterministic. The context-free grammar is non-deterministic. How does the context-free grammar determine what choices to make? It's which productions are chosen. When a context-free grammar makes a non-deterministic choice, it chooses which productions to apply. Does it, when you produce A here, does it choose AA or does it choose epsilon? Which one is actually the number of a's, the number, the difference that m is greater than n, right? So the choices here non-determinism makes chooses the string produced. Similar thing here, because if there's an a at the top of the stack, it gets to either choose to push little a capital A or the empty string. So here, the, the choice that the, if the a is at the top of the stack, the PDA gets to non-deterministically choose between both of these. And that exactly lines up with the non-determinism of the context-free grammar. So the non-determinism of the PDA is what simulates the non-determinism of the grammar, thankfully. Let's consider a, a computation on this PDA. Another thing, interesting thing, a great thing about this PDA, the reason we want it to be able to push arbitrarily long strings is then now our quote-unquote PDA only has three states. It's really simple. It's just one really big self-loop. Um, all right, let's consider a computation of this PDA on input uh, A, A, B. 
Okay? So we begin with A, A, B, and we look at A, and we have an empty stack. What we're going to do is then uh, uh, push S dollar sign. So we're going to say A, A, B. And the stack now contains S dollar sign. We're now at this middle state. Uh, what are the transitions we can take? We can either read, and if there's an A at the top of the stack, we could take those. We can only take this one, S, pop S, push A, T. Right? Uh, now what transitions can we take? We can take, we can't take these because there's no A at the top of the stack. We can take only these two. So we can choose to pop A and push little a, big A, and we'll do that choice. We'll make that choice non-deterministically. So we'll say, and wait, I have not read the input. Notice that deep into the stack, we have a capital T and a dollar sign. We haven't forgotten about those. We just can't read them yet. They're just down there somewhere. Well, notice that we have an A in the input and an A in the top of the stack. So we're, we're going to choose to take that transition and cancel those out. So we'll, we'll match the A in the input to the A on the top of the stack. Now there's an A on the top, a capital A on the top of the stack. We'll non-deterministically choose this one. So we'll pop that off and push nothing. The stack only now contains t dollar sign. You should still observe what's going on. t dollar sign is going to produce the remaining suffix of the string. It's going to produce ab, right? So what we'll do then is we'll pop t off the stack and push a production of t. The production of t is going to be atb. Now we have an A on the input and an A on the top of the stack, so we're going to cancel those out. We'll pop the A and advance the input. The top of the stack now contains T, B, dollar sign. We see the T on the input. What are we going to do? We're going to pop it off. Not deterministically choose to take this production of the T. There's a B on the top of the stack. What we're going to do is cancel off uh, those Bs. We'll match them together, and we'll advance the input. The input is empty. The stack only has a canary in it. We'll take our final transition. We'll pop the canary off the top of the stack and accept. This PDA then accepts the string AAB. Right? Now notice as the steps, although it is, looks, looks a little cumbersome with the notation, the steps of the PDA do correctly simulate the exact working productions of the string. If I were to write out the productions of the string, it would be S goes to, it would be S produces A T, produces little a big A T, produces A T, produces A A T B produces uh, A, A, B, right? Unfortunately, because the PDA can't reach deep into the stack, it actually only does one production. It does the, what's, what we would call the leftmost production, right? Here, you can choose to produce T and then produce A. There's many ways you can apply the productions of a grammar. The PDA will always simulate the leftmost one because that's what's at the top of the stack. It'll choose the first non-terminal to produce. So here it produces A and then removes A before it advancing T, right? Even though there's multiple productions, they all lead to the same strings. So it's fine. Right. Questions on this, on this example?
since P correctly accepts exactly and only the strings produced by grammar G, L of P is equal to L of G. Since this is for any, for any L in LC of G, we see that LC of G is a subset of LPDA. Awesome. Is that really a good proof? Sort of proof by example, proof by, oh, it's obvious how the simulation works. Um, it's enough of a proof for us. Next time, we'll do the reverse proof, proving that a, uh, for every PDA, there's a CFG. We'll do the reverse of the double second attainment, and then that will require two uh, double inductions for the, for the if and only if, exactly and only. That is going to take us the full lecture to do uh, next time. Any more questions on conversion of a CFG into a PDA? Here we observe it, that the PDAs are uh, at least as powerful as the CFGs. It turns out we'll prove that they're exactly as powerful. Any questions on the, uh, this proof? Excellent. See you guys Tuesday.